with KP1077 in adults with idiopathic hypersomnia, sponsored by Zebra Therapeutics. I am uh, Renee Brockman, Senior VP of Clinical Development at Zebra, and my co-author of this presentation is Dr. Chris Drake. He's the Director of Sleep Research at the Henry Ford Health in Detroit, Michigan, and he's also the Principal Investigator of our Zebra Phase two study with KP1077. We will take turns in uh, presenting parts of the presentation, and that's, uh, that presentation is outlined in the next slide here. Uh, I will give a short overview of Zebra as a company. Uh, Dr. Drake will then follow with a short over, uh, background of the uh, disease of idiopathic hypersomnia or IH. Uh, I will follow then with an explanation of the product KP1077 as a new treatment option for the treatment of idiopathic hypersomnia. And then Dr. Drake will finish with an overview about the Zebra's phase two study in IH. So Zebra uh, started actually out as ChemFarm, was founded uh, several years ago by a number of chemists. ChemFarm standing for Chem for Chemistry and Farm, of course, for Pharmaceutics. And earlier this year, the company uh, revisited their mission and changed the name to Zebra. There's no change in control of the or leadership of the company. Um, but the name was changed in line with a new focus. Very important, the focus of Zebra is to actually develop therapeutics for rare diseases um, and to create transformational therapies for diseases with limited or no treatment options. And our logo, which represents a zebra, Zebra, means uh, zebra in Greek. And as you all know, the zebra is kind of the mascot for rare diseases, uh, because indeed there are more horses than zebras, so they are relatively rare. And the stripes on the zebras represent the, all the different uh, possibilities of new therapies, uh, but also all the different rare diseases or their different variations. At Zebra, we try to push the boundaries beyond what's possible to advance new therapies. But in that approach, we want to put the patient as a, as a, at the center of what we do. So we are driven by a patient-centric approach and coupled with that, the outside the box strategies that that we have and that we try to apply to develop promising product candidates for rare diseases. We have many experts all the way from the laboratory to the patient. They're, they include scientists, patients, advocates, development strategists, medical, pharmaceutical, commercialization specialists, and business leaders all with a proven record of bringing new therapies to patients. So we specialize in following the data to advance therapies and to find solutions to overcome complex clinical and regulatory challenges. Uh, Zevra has uh, two products at this point um, in late stage development. Uh, one is for Neumann Pick's disease, an ultra rare disease, and the other ones, and we will talk about this a little bit more today, is for rare sleep diseases, uh, including idiopathic hypersomnia. I will now give the floor to Dr. Drake, uh, who will give us some background about the IH disease. Thank you, Renee. I appreciate it. And we're going to be focusing on idiopathic hypersomnia and its treatment today. Um, it is a, a condition which is a complex condition in sleep medicine. In fact, we don't have a, a real good idea about the causes of idiopathic hypersomnia, hence the term idiopathic. Um, and we're going to talk about a new approach 
to the treatment of this, these, of this disorder. Uh, it is a disorder which uh, many patients struggle with and, and some still continue to struggle with uh, over the years. So I'm going to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about uh, how this uh, disease is characterized. Um, but first, just a little bit of background on the next slide. We know that sleepiness is, is a common problem. You know, we see here the percentage of the population uh, that experiences sleepiness is upwards of 20%. And almost everyone in the general population experiences sleepiness on at least a, an occasional basis. In fact, again, up to 20% of that general population uh, reports high levels of sleepiness. But on the next slide, we can see that when we talk about sleepiness, in sleep disorders, for example, such as idiopathic hypersomnia, these individuals are experiencing a greater, a much greater level of sleepiness, something in sleep medicine uh, that we call excessive sleepiness. And you can see this Epworth sleepiness sc scale score on the bottom here. And those, you can see those with idiopathic hypersomnia have very, very high levels of sleepiness. It really characterizes uh, the condition and it's a symptom that can occur in many sleep disorders. And what we're focusing on in this trial is the sleep disorder, idiopathic hypersomnia. So on the next slide, we sort of wanna get an idea of what idiopathic hypersomnia is. And again, it's characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness, which we can think of basically as an irres irrepressible need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep. Oftentimes patients will be falling asleep regularly throughout the day during activities. Uh, those can be activities at work, can be driving home from work or to work. Um, and that's a very, very difficult symptom, a medical symptom that these patients deal with and one of the most important in this disorder. Patients will oftentimes report something we call sleep drunkenness or sleep inertia, which is really a prolonged difficulty waking up, particularly in the morning when you have frequent re-entries into sleep, individuals have a very difficult time maintaining wakefulness during the initial uh, hour or so of waking up, waking up with confusion, waking up some, with some automated behavior that may not recognize, and of, oftentimes some irritability goes along with that. There can be unrefreshing nighttime sleep as well. So the main sleep period may even last up to 10 or more hours, but patients will wake up oftentimes unrefreshed from that uh, overnight sleep period, even if it is an extended sleep period. There also can be, in addition to the unrefreshing nighttime sleep, unrefreshing naps. So because of the excessive sleepiness that these individuals are experiencing, um, daytime naps, which can last you know, well over an hour, tend not to be very refreshing. And the patients really don't experience a benefit in improved alertness from prescribed or scheduled naps um, that they may be uh, experiencing during the day. And so that can also go along with some cognitive dysfunction. So you have some impaired cognition, things like brain fog, problems with memory and attention. Patients often report uh, their mind going blank for a period or two and, and making mistakes in very habitual activities that they may be very used to on a regular basis. So next slide. One of the consequences uh, of idiopathic hypersomnia, and in fact, many sleep disorders, is uh, you know ex excessive sleepiness can be a major risk factor for drowsy driving and automotive accidents. And so this is one of the main reasons why it's very important to treat this disorder. Patients are suffering during the day, as we mentioned, and they're also at risk uh, for automotive accidents. And the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration has estimated that even between 2005 and 2009, drowsy driving is responsible for an annual average of 83,000 crashes, 37,000 injury-related crashes, and oftentimes these are highly severe crashes and some can even lead to fatalities. Um, up to 6,000, it's estimated, fatal crashes each year may be caused uh, by drowsy drivers, uh, including patients who are suffering and continue to suffer with excessive sleepiness related to idiopathic hypersomnia. Next slide. 
So now we're going to talk about the treatment of excessive sleepiness. And while there are many options available in some cases, um, oftentimes patients will present to our sleep clinics uh, after trying a variety of different methods to help them stay awake during the daytime and, and treat their excessive sleepiness. That could be, you know, nat homeopathic remedies, natural remedies, things they've seen on the internet. Probably the most common uh, way that individuals try to treat their excessive sleepiness is by the use of caffeine. We can see a little uh, strung out cat here uh, and, and they're really telling themselves they got to cut back on the caffeine. One of the problems with caffeine is you develop a tolerance to it and you increase doses and that can interfere with nocturnal sleep as well. So next slide. I'm going to turn things back over to Renee now, who's going to talk a little bit about a new treatment option for idiopathic hypersomnia, and then we'll go into some detail about our trial. Uh, thanks, Dr. Drake. Uh, yeah, I will talk a little bit about uh, Zevras KP1077 product as a new treatment option for IH. These are uh, capsules. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about the uh, pharmaceutical ingredient in the capsules and what the uh, potential benefits are uh, of this molecule um, compared to, to other treatment options. The uh, compound that uh, we have in uh, these capsules uh, are based on Zevra's prodrug technology, and I want to explain this a little bit. So what the chemists at Zebra have done, they have taken, or they actually it's being developed for other indications as well. The paradigm is to take an approved drug with suboptimal properties. And this is the gray representation here on the left side, uh, which is this approved drug that can be uh, improved on. And then take another molecule, that is very safe, that's known for many years to be very safe, and that's, we call that a ligand. And the ligand and the approved drug are then combined, they are chemically linked together. And that's the, in the cartoon here, you see this in the middle here, uh, that is a pro-drug with improved attributes, potentially improved attributes. So this is the new molecule that is being developed in the lab and then studied and what happens is if you take this prodrug, um, you take it following ingestion, normal human metabolic processes cleave the ligand and release the active drug. So this is all this is all being developed and is all being designed such that if you take it orally, that on the right side here, that the ligand comes free from the active molecule and then the purple part. Uh, gets then absorbed uh, and is in the bloodstream and goes to organs where it does the same uh, thing that the uh, original approved drug does. And in order to this general scheme, in order this uh, to to know to apply this for the drug we have at hand today, I show this here on the on the next slide. The prodrug that uh, we are discussing today is Sardex methylphenidate or SDX. So SDX is in the SKP1077 capsules, and the molecule is shown here. In the purple part, which is in the active drug, is dexmethylphenidate or dimethylphenidate or DMPH. That's the purple part. And then the ligand is in green, just like in the cartoon. Um, a number of uh, small molecules that are very safe, that are inactive, and if you uh, string them all together, chemically bind them to the purple part, this is what you get as the, as the molecule. So what does it, what, this is designed um, to, uh, when orally, you orally take this, um, it travels down to the GI tract and in the lower intestines, uh, the process of cleaving appears enzymatically, and then the active part, which is the methylphenidate, the purple part, comes loose and is then absorbed into the bloodstream. And that process uh, takes some time to happen, and it leads to several benefits that this molecule have, several attributes that are better than 
uh, D-methylphenidate by itself. And here are these uh, uh, listed. There are two major attributes. One of them is less abuse potential. SDX has less abuse potential, and we have proven this with uh, three studies, um, than D-methylphenidate by itself. And the reason for that is that the uh, the prodr itself is not active, so it needs to travel down the intestines in order to be liberated. So if you're going to take the molecule by other ways, like abusers just snort their drugs or they inject it, it will not work. It needs to go through the GI tract. And also you have a unique pharmacokinetic profile. And for those of you that are not familiar with pharmacokinetics, what is it? Pharmacokinetics, or PK for short, is the drugs st study, uh, the drugs journey through a person's body. Um, as we all know, when you when you take a drug orally, it needs to get to your blood. From your blood, it goes to organs where it uh, it exerts its activity. So the uh, bloodstream is an easy way of uh, measuring and or looking and studying the pharmacokinetics by taking blood samples. You can then take the cells out of the blood and what's left over is the plasma. And in the plasma, you can measure over time after taking the drug, you can measure the concentrations, the levels of that drug in a person's plasma. And the total amount of drug in that plasma, the peak level of the drug, and also the time it takes to reach that peak level are very important characteristics to understand uh, the safety and the effectiveness of, of the drug. And because it takes some time, the, the concentrations go up slowly in blood and they go down slowly in blood. So you don't have the peaks that you normally would get when you take D-methylphenidate as a, as a bolus drug where you can have sharp peaks that may lead potentially to side effects, which we probably could avoid uh, with this molecule. So SDX as part of KP1077 is in clinical development for idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy. And we have two active INDs uh, with the FDA to uh, continue our studies in patients with these diseases. Just a little bit more about the pharmacokinetic profile. Um, and so this shows you the pharmacokinetics of SDX derived demelophenidate. So SDX itself, unchanged, is not active. It needs to set free the DMPH, and that's what we measure, we are measuring here. So you can see uh, on the y-axis, we're measuring the concentrations. And on the x-axis, you have the time. And this shows uh, the profile um, after multiple doses, multiple daily doses uh, of once a day. And this is one of the regimens, the dosing regimens that we are exploring in our phase two study uh, that uh, Dr. Rick is going to talk about it later. And one of the uh, treatment re regimens is once daily, just before bedtime. And this has an example. If a patient goes to bed at 10 p.m., it takes his dose, as you can see on the arrow on the bottom there, takes a dose at 10 p.m. And you can see that the first four hours, there are not a lot of uh, increases in the concentrations uh, of, uh, of the active compound. And then it starts to go up. And again, that's related to the fact that we have a prodrug and it needs to get into the lower intestines. So th the, the levels go up and the peak then occurs around waking the next morning between 6 and 8 a.m. And by if patients uh, go to bed earlier or later, if we make them take the drug before they go to bed, they would still have the highest levels in the morning in the next day and hopefully as we will show then uh, in our phase two study that's going on will have probably a beneficial hopefully a beneficial effect on daytime sleepiness now the other regimen that we are uh, exploring is taking the same dose and giving it twice a day giving it 
the same dose split in half. So half uh, in the morning and half at night. So this shows this in the next slide superimposed of what I just explained about once a day dosing. So this is twice daily. And this is a patient uh, again that uh, goes to bed at 10, wakes up at eight in the morning the next day. And what you see here, because it's twice uh, dosing, you see the, the typical profile uh, in the first uh, half of this trajectory, but then during the daytime hours, and you can see that uh, orange shaded area are the daytime hours, you can see that because of the delay, that in the latter part of the day, you get more of the active compound demelophenidate in the plasma. And that would maybe show us then uh, a better activity that is spread out over the daytime hours. So these are the two dosing regimens that we uh, are exploring in our phase two study. And based on this, um, based on the pharmacokinetics of the drug, we would expect that it works very well. And we'll, we'll see that by the end of the year when we hope to complete this phase two study. I give it, uh, the word back uh, to Dr. Drake, who will talk about the phase two trial. Thanks, Renee. And let's just go right to the next slide where I'm going to sort of give you an overview very briefly of what the study design is to test the efficacy of this new medication. And it really has this particular study three phases. The first one, as you can see on the left, is really a screening phase of approximately one month. And that could be a little bit shorter or a bit longer uh, than one month, but it's a period of time where we're evaluating uh, the, uh, the eligibility for a particular patient to be in the study. And then uh, phase two is where they're officially enrolled and given um, the medication. And it's an open label period of five weeks, which means you're going to uh, get the medication uh, during that five week period, it will be either once daily or twice daily, as Renee mentioned. And then uh, the, the medication is what we call titrated up or down. It's slowly increased over the first couple of weeks and then modified according to the response of the patient uh, to the medication. If uh, the medication, uh, the patient is responding to the medication, there's a slight increase the following week. And if the patient's feeling uh, like the medication may be producing some uh, potential difficulty sleeping or some other uh, potential side effects, uh, the medication can be titrated back down to an appropriate level. And then once that uh, last week is completed, uh, we go into what's called the double blind withdrawal period, which is a period of two weeks where patients who are on their stable doses of the medication are randomly assigned to either maintain their dose uh, that they were at at the end of the five weeks or randomly assigned to placebo. And that placebo uh, goes on or medication goes on for another two weeks. And uh, obviously there are evaluations of sleepiness throughout this protocol. It's kind of nice with this protocol, we're focusing on the clinical uh, responses. So patients are not required to sleep overnight in the laboratory. Um, in most cases, that's not required if you've already had a diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. And so um, most of the time, these are going to be uh, clinical interviews for uh, the therapeutic response to the medication. Um, and you can see a number of the visits here, including a follow-up safety visit after one week at the end of the trial. Next slide. In terms of eligibility criteria, oftentimes uh, these uh, trials, in this case, phase two trial, can have a lot of, of requirements for being eligible. Uh, we see here, one of the things is patients need to be 18 years of age or older and meet the following criteria. They have to be previously diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia. Now you can have a patient who, uh, an individual who is not yet diagnosed, but 
who uh, may have idiopathic hypersomnia and then uh, gets diagnosed by their sleep uh, clinician uh, or other clinician and then gets referred into the trial after that. Um, and so, so this is what the screening period is for. And then once the screening period is over, patients are, are then uh, into the open label phase. Patients have to be able to give informed consent and have excessive daytime sleepiness as measured by sleepiness questionnaires, similar to what we talked about earlier in the presentation. Patients will also have to agree to wash out from all current medications that may affect daytime sleepiness or nighttime sleep. Um, and we also do not allow patients who are pregnant or who are, or who are planning to get pregnant or breastfeed during the study. Now, these are the main criteria, some of the more important ones uh, to consider, but this is, of course, not a complete list of eligibility criteria, and the study physician will review all those requirements with uh, potential participants. Next slide. Now, if you have idiopathic hypersomnia, and, and many of you in the audience may, and you're interested in participating in this study to, to look at this new treatment, and I think it's a very unique opportunity because there are no medications out there at the present time that are really specifically designed to address some of that morning grogginess, that morning sleep drunkenness or sleep inertia that patients oftentimes experience. There are a number of sites throughout the U.S. with locations seen here. Um, I think at this time we have above 40 sites uh, that are available. Uh, that So there is typically going to be a site within um, you know, a reasonable distance from, from those of you uh, who are in the audience. And I think there is even a pamphlet that's available at the conference if you're there in person um, that will give you an idea of where your, your local site might be. Uh, next slide. So just in terms of assistance to participants in the study, we really appreciate um, the willingness of, of patients to volunteer for participation in these trials. We could not do these trials without um, your, your help and your volunteering. Um, and there is no cost for patients to participate in the study, um, but there is compensation, um, monetary compensation for the time uh, that you might put in to the trial. And there's also payment for sleep, overnight sleep studies and nap studies in a sleep lab which is only needed if you're a newly diagnosed patient, um, but oftentimes that's very help helpful, um, particularly for patients who may not have uh, an ability to, to pay for those. Um, there's certainly reimbursement of travel expenses to and from the study site, so patients don't have to drive. Obviously, that can be a concern. And uh, for more information about the study design, the qualification, the qualification criteria, and additional information, you can visit uh, our website at www.hypersomniafoundation.org slash research dash studies slash clinical trials.gov. That is a um, compendium of clinical trials throughout the United States. And this is our registered trial on that site. You can also email medical affairs at zevra.com for more information as well. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it there. Thank you all for your attention. I thank Renee for his. Uh, Part of the presentation and I'm going to open things up uh, for uh, questions. Unfortunately, we're not um, there in person if you're looking at this uh, uh, presentation, but we thank you very much uh, for uh, giving us your time to listen. Thank you.